I think we, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you are uh, joining us from. Uh, my name is Rajiv Tucker, and I'm uh, delighted to be going live with my uh, group of panelists here. And uh, today we're going to talk about enterprise-grade Kubernetes and, you know, very, very excited to sort of talk today uh, to everyone who's joining us. And uh, what I'll do is sort of uh, have all of the panelists sort of introduce themselves and uh, give a fun fact about themselves in their <laughs> intro. And then we'll get into the main topic, which is you know how to deploy enterprise great Kubernetes. And uh, yeah, looking forward to this session. Keep your questions rolling because uh, we'll we'll answer them live. Um, and so uh, maybe I'll start first. So my name is Rajiv Tucker. I lead product marketing uh, for VMware Cloud and uh, platforms and services. And uh, anything related to you know vSphere with Tanzu or VCF with Tanzu or even our project Pacific announcements going two years ago are things that I've worked on. And very happy to share sort of my perspective uh, on deploying enterprise great Kubernetes today. Uh, fun fact about me is uh, I love multitasking. And so this whole remote work environment has sort of really helped me, you know, sort of uh, hone into that skill a lot more and achieve a lot. Uh, I don't know if that was fun, so I'll probably just try and make it fun. Uh, really enjoy, uh, you know, hiking and, and biking out here in San Francisco. The, this summer has been great. So, so uh, all that commute time that, uh, you know, we used to spend in going to the office, that's where I'm deploying it, hiking and biking. So over to you, Ning, uh, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a fun fact? Well, I'm curious, because yeah. uh -huh. you're a multitasker, can you hike and bike at the same time? You don't even know, like I'm sitting on a, on a bike right now <laughs> under my desk here. Um, hi everyone, uh, Ning here. Um, so I'm from the product marketing team of the VMware Tanzu team. And I have joined VMware uh, for about five years. Kind of started uh, joining the cloud native apps BU that time. So like five years ago, uh, Kubernetes is still quite nascent. And I have seen like it getting so popular in the last five years. And the Cloud Native Apps BU grow, grow to like, they, we have like thousands of people today in our BU. So, um, and also I've seen the journey VMware took to really help our customers to run Kubernetes. So yeah, it's really happy to be here and talk about Kubernetes with um, of the folks here. Um, and a fun fact about me, <laughs> It's like such a short time. I'm, I'm not, not a very fun person, <laughs> I guess. So um, I will say um, I like spicy food. So um, so I'm kind of like exploring like all sorts of spicy food across different cultural and different. Um, I, I, I like Indian spicy food too, <laughs> Rajiv. So cool. yeah. We mm -hmm. need to fly some places. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice Good to be fun. here. Thank you, Ning. Uh, Kyle, why don't you go next? Hello, uh, my name is Kyle Gleed. I'm part of the uh, technical marketing team looking after VMware Cloud Foundation. So I focus on the, the full stack, so running vSphere together with vSAN, together with NSX and the vRealize suite and implementing that private cloud experience. And then uh, layering on top of that, the new Kubernetes capabilities built into vSphere with Tanzu. Uh, so I've been at VMware for about 11 years. Um, so it's been quite a fun ride and uh, I really look forward to uh, where we're going from here. As far as a fun fact, um, I like to road trip. I have a Winnebago Travado and me and my wife like to take off and just travel the country and sleep in our van and uh, you know, go back to the, the hippie days of the 70s sometimes, so. Thank nice. you, thank you. That sounds super fun. I'll just add one thing, like this seems to be a common theme across some, Tech marketing folks, your fun fact. I know someone else who does this, the exact same thing. <laughs> really cool. I guess I'll kind of wrap it up here a little bit. So my name is Kenny Coleman. I'm a senior technical marketing manager focused on the Tanzu portfolio, kind of looking at a lot of stuff with Tanzu Basic and Tanzu Standard. So so Ning, I work with her day in, day out on a, a lot of the things over here. So I've been with VMware uh, actually about three maybe four years now, but my tenure here is actually close to 11 because I came over from oh. another company and I go into our, our online portal and it says I've been here for 11 years now. So that's, that's kind of interesting yet. I've never gotten like a 10 year old, like death star that says, you know, you hit some milestones. So I'll have to 
I'll have to talk to somebody in HR about that one. But <laughs> I've been doing, uh, like I said, I've been in the VMware ecosystem for a long time now. I started back in VI 3.5 days, uh, spoke at my first time at VMworld back in 2010. And then I kind of got away from doing VMware for a while. I kind of said, like, I've learned everything I possibly ever wanted to know about VMware. And We'll figure out what, what's next. And so I started getting into application development and started writing a few different programs, which ended up starting me with another group that we were an open source team with inside the walls of uh, this other company called EMC back in the day. And we ended up actually writing the genesis for what is today the, uh, the CSI or the container storage interface for Kubernetes. So we were doing a lot of stuff with Docker and Kubernetes very, very early on. Um, gosh, six, seven, eight years ago now. So um, really cool to, cool to kind of see the, the transition. Um, since then, I've been on the Kubernetes release team three times. So I've kind of seen the process of what it looks like to actually go and release a 1.x version and, and kind of what it takes to get that out the door. I was the, the feature enhancement lead for three of those releases as well. Uh, fun fact about me, I'll give a fun fact one about Ning as well, because <laughs> she thinks she thinks she's not she's not fun. So uh, if you rewind back, I think it was three years ago at VMworld, uh -huh. you saw some people walking around in cloud suits. And that was Ning. It was Ning and I we were the ones that oh, were yeah. actually doing that. Yeah. So oh, I, don't, really? I don't know if we if we offered or we got voluntold to do it. But I do remember and I think Steve Wong did it as well. But I do remember yeah. we had these I remember that no. big bulky suits and <laughs> me being me. I'm like, I'm not going to go wear this for a week at VMworld. So I went and got like a a $50 suit tailored for $200. So I was just like, I had to, I had to make sure it fit. There you, go, more, there you go. More impressive the mm -hmm. fact that you did that or the fact that you admit it three years later. Yeah. <laughs> I still I still have the suit. Okay, okay. No wonder. I'm pretty sure I ran into you folks. And if I knew it was you too, I would have actually suggested you show up in this today for the live. But thanks, right. Kenny. Uh, you actually have an envious amount of followers on social media. So it is uh, my personal goal uh, to, to sort of uh, get there some sometime a decade later, because you do have a crazy amount of followers. So we'll, we'll get uh, into the topic now that we're, you know, introduced ourselves and we've talked about our fun facts. And uh, so I think, you know, why are we here? So of course, you know, Kubernetes has taken off as a technology, right? It's it's maturing, and organizations are still sort of trying to understand uh, enterprises specifically, you know, how to deploy Kubernetes in production and at scale. And you know, we'd love to talk about all of those things. But let's step back a little bit, right? Uh, you know, our in, within VMware, like as as uh, Ning mentioned, uh, modern apps business unit is growing like crazy. There's a similar amount of growth that has happened at KubeCon in terms of just the number of attendees and you know, vendors and all the technologies that the community is bringing to the market for app development and also the infrastructure that goes underneath it, right? Uh, so what are we really seeing as some of the key challenges that customers are facing, especially enterprise customers and also, you know, enterprises of all sizes, right? Uh, with respect to Kubernetes, let's start with that. Yeah, I'll kind of take a first stab at it. So. It's it's fresh to me because I was creating a, a new presentation for VMworld this year that was kind of very much like I need to figure out like what are the problem statements, what are the issues that people are having with it, and it set me down uh, the old Google engine search, and I looked at it and I said there's a lot of the things that were in here that we're solving today with inside of the product portfolio. Um, we think about security. What are the the images that we have to deploy for our just the operating system and for Kubernetes and working about interoperability, knowing that anything that you're going to work, that you're going to be putting in the stack is going to be working. And the upgrade process, the upgrade procedure, A, is it going to work, making sure that it is going to, you're going to have some sort of efficiency going forward and that you have something or some team that's testing for you uh, as it's going through here. You know, so security upgrades, patches, the just general life cycle, has been a big part of it. Um, we also think about the images themselves. Um, you, you're running just Nginx or SQL or whatever it is, you wanna make sure that that's patched, it's used, it's ready. Um, where are you hosting this? How are you able to provide enterprise features for it? And those are just some of the things that, you know, kind of come at the top of mind of 
you know, some of the things that, you know, we can talk a little bit later of, yeah. of what the, some of the projects and some of the products inside of Tonsi portfolios are, are solving to address some of these issues that a lot of people are having of not just getting started with it, but taking it into production and day two operations. Yeah, we, we actually just had a uh, survey, uh, like State of Kubernetes Survey 2021. Uh, that survey actually published um, on the our website. Um, and it actually shows that the customer, like the survey, the enterprises we surveyed, actually stating that one of the number, like number one diff, uh, challenges they have uh, when establishing Kubernetes infrastructure is lack of expertise. They, they don't have the right person in the organization, right knowledge in the organization to actually do that. So um, I, I know it's it's hard to kind of retrain your staff. It's hard to hire uh, Kubernetes experts from the market today. So for a lot of enterprises, they just don't feel they have the right people to do that. Yeah. yeah and I would add on to that thing that mm -hmm. uh, so you know, you're trying to take this new technology and all these new capabilities and bring it in to make it part of your, your infrastructure. Um, you need to build off what you already have. And for those customers, many of them, they're, they're vSphere experts. They know vSphere, they know VMware. So the fact that we're able to basically take this vSphere and build Kubernetes into it so that as a vSphere admin, I can go into the vSphere web client and I can configure and set up Kubernetes. And I can uh, make this infrastructure available to my developers in a way that I can control access and uh, consumption um, all from this familiar interface. Um, that's a big win. And not only am I doing this to help the vSphere admins become kind of Kubernetes capable, Kubernetes aware, but we're doing it in a way that the developers don't have to change the way they access it. They can access it just like they would any cloud. It's just another cloud. And so it's really about bringing those two worlds together. And so it's about taking this challenge we have of how to embrace this new technology without stretching everybody too thin. You know, take what we know is in common, bring them together. This is a very good point. I'll, I'll echo this. And, and I'll just say that, of course, this is, you know, our point of view at VMware. But, you know, we have heard this feedback directly from a lot of the VI admins and vSphere admins. Going back to the days when we announced Project Pacific and then we got vSphere and VCF at the hands of the market, you know, we admins would like from like several parts of the world, different industries and organizations coming to us and saying, thank you for doing this, right? And bringing, you know, the ability to run modern workloads through the tools that we're familiar with. So like we can like basically up level ourselves in this new modern world. Uh, but let's deep dive into this persona conversation a bit, right? Uh, who are these personas? Can we sort of take a stab at discussing, you know, when any organization is running a modern apps, you know, project or, you know, deploying an application, what are the typical titles that we hear about and what are their roles? And realizing that obviously there's not a set standard across each organization because, you know, everyone is at a different pace and a different stage in the app modernization journey. And obviously their talent base is like different, but, can we talk a little bit about the personas, uh, more the more so the newer ones? Obviously, we know about the vSphere and, and the VI admins. Yeah, so um, like when when the Kubernetes this technology comes up, like the same, I think at the same time, there's another culture called like DevOps culture um, is kind of emerging. I think this uh, Kubernetes is kind of more on the technology side. The DevOps is more on kind of culture and a practice side. And then these two trends are kind of side by side, um, kind of getting popular. And uh, today we see uh, a lot of uh, kind of DevOps titles and SREs um, and um, like platform operators. That's another uh, common titles we see um, and Kubernetes operators too. And um, as Rajiv just said, um, because different enterprises are there had different stages of adopting this technology, adopting DevOps, so um, and different titles can mean different things in, for different companies. Uh, but uh, we have seen this uh, trend of trying to get IT and dev together and a lot of new personas are emerging out to carry the kind of responsibilities for both sides and doing a lot of automations, a lot of uh, uh, kind of, kind of dev for IT uh, type of work. 
Um, yeah, we see that a lot of uh, times, uh, especially when we play around like Kubernetes in the Kubernetes space. Yeah, and to kind of delta off that one too, I mean, you just see mm -hmm. the the idea of what the, the operator is changing today. Yeah. So the operator that was the vSphere admin is probably learning how to become maybe a little bit of a Kubernetes admin. And a lot of what's being built with inside of you know, the walls here at VMware today, what we're looking inside of vSphere is, is enabling vSphere admins to become a little bit more um, you know, familiar with the technology without having to get rid of everything that you learned in VMware. And you don't have to just become a Kubernetes admin overnight, but instead a lot of the content that you learn can all translate into what you're being able to provide as infrastructure for the new operators or what are the people that would be consuming the Kubernetes infrastructure uh, as well. And before, Kyle, I know you were going to chime in there, but I do want to say shout out to uh, Shamistan from, from Turkey and there's uh, Salam from Stockholm in the comments. So uh, thanks everybody for tuning in around the world. So feel free to drop your location in the comments. So we'll, uh, it's good to see that. Yeah, and also feel free to ask any questions. And if you have any specific topic you, you want us to discuss around Kubernetes, just feel free to uh, add in the comment. Yeah, and I just want to piggyback on that last comment about the personas and stuff and to Kenny's comments about how, you know, the traditional roles are changing. And, you know, I work on VMware Cloud Foundation. And if you're not familiar with the VMware Cloud Foundation, it's really about bringing together all the products under the, the VMware kind of software defined data center umbrella and, and implementing them in a way that's standardized, repeatable, scalable. And one of the challenges we face with doing this is we need to break down those data center silos. You know, the, you know, I've been in IT for a long time. I started in 1988 and I've, I've seen, you know, I, I've worked with teams. I've been part of teams where we focus on storage. We focus on networking. I build servers. And um, when you need infrastructure, you come to me and we open up help desk tickets and we pass those around and it takes a long time to do anything. When you go to a cloud environment, you need to be aware of, you know, okay, what networks do I need? What, uh, am I doing DACP, static assignments? Where are those IP addresses coming from? How am I gonna do routing? Routing tables gonna be updated? So it all kind of comes in and now you layer Kubernetes on top of that. Um, so there's definitely a need to, uh, you know, help expand those skill sets and get those people uh, able to basically take this broader look and become more of a cloud admin persona as opposed to specializing in these different little buckets. We have a really cool question along those lines uh, from Rick Walsworth. That name seems familiar, uh, but how much Kubernetes does a VI admin really need to know to manage Kubernetes? This is actually very good, right? Because it's also the level of expertise that we're talking about here. I, I do want to be careful that we're not really proposing or suggesting that a VI admin learn coding constructs, right? This is not the focus of, of the point of view here. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really to think that we are now enabling the people that are using Kubernetes already to enable the infrastructure of vSphere. And it's not this, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know exactly Rick where, you know, where your, your production standpoint is, but for the most part, when you are wanting to run an application in production, it's usually not the VI admin that's installing it and running it and operating and, and doing software updates to the application. Uh, instead, there's an application owner. And that application mm -hmm. owner is going to have control over that domain. And what you're able to do is be able to supply that, that application owner with the resources, uh, CPU, RAM, and network, and disk of, of making sure that they can fulfill whatever application need there is. So uh, it's done through a, a multitude of different ways, but really the, the VI admin is going to be responsible for making sure you kind of carve out that infrastructure and making it available to the, the new application owners or to the new Kubernetes operators. Yeah, and I would follow that up um, by saying that the VI admin needs to know what Kubernetes is and they need to be able to understand the core Kubernetes concepts of, you know, a, a you know, in the, the VMware Tanzu, this idea of a Tanzu Kubernetes cluster, uh, a pod VM, you know, you need to have some basic understanding what those are. But aside from that, um, it's all about basically building vSphere clusters, 
creating these things called namespaces and then handing them over to your developers. The developers are the one that comes in. They're the ones that do kubectl. They're the ones that deal with YAML manifest. They're the ones that go in and talk about control plane versus worker nodes and cube cuddle and all that stuff. Um, that's something that vSphere admin doesn't really have to concern themselves with as much as I'm building a vSphere cluster. I'm going to enable this Kubernetes control plane using these automated capabilities, and then I'm going to uh, make that available to my developers based on some, some guidelines I have. And then it's hands off. So, so really, you don't need to know a lot about Kubernetes. Now, obviously, the more you get into it, the more you learn. And the more you learn, the better you'll be. But to get started, it's really pretty easy. And that's one of the things that's really nice about vSphere with Kubernetes is it is simply uh, go in and a few clicks. Probably the hardest part, uh, in my experience, is figure out the networking. Because we do have this concept of uh, ciders that you need for like pods and services and ingress and egress. Um, you'll have to get through some of that. So there's a learning curve, but it's very small, very minimal. Thanks for clarifying. And again, appreciate both point of views, uh, Kenny and Kyle. As we've noticed, right, after talking to so many customers, each, each customer from different industry, different vertical, are at a different phase in their maturity in terms of having a DevOps organization and an and a IT organization who can like handle Kubernetes. But it was good to sort of clarify that we're not proposing that IT admins become developers, right? You know, in very maybe different this, functions, right? Yeah. Maybe this would be a good time to jump into a quick demo. I can kind of show you uh, my lab and show you what vSphere with Kubernetes looks like and uh, kind of show you kind of how, how that works. So if you want to do that, um, I go ahead and I'm sharing my screen. So hopefully that will pop up here. There we go. So this is just, uh, this is actually a cloud foundation environment. And so you'll see it's the vSphere web client. You'll see I have uh, actually three V centers, and these are all configured in enhanced link mode. So I have a single pane of glass up here. You know, you'll see I have a number of VMs. This is my my infrastructure components. But you'll notice here I got this uh, cluster zero one and this workload domain zero one. It's got three hosts currently, but you'll notice there's a new object here called a namespace. Um, so that's going to get created when I enable Kubernetes. And if I expand this out, you'll see that I have these namespaces. I call them namespace 0, 0.1, 0.2, not very creative. Um, and you'll notice I have these three supervisor control plane VMs. So these are components that are automatically configured for me when I go in and enable Kubernetes. Um, and the way I do that is I come up here under menu, and you'll see there's a new workload management option. I come in here, and you'll see that I can go to the Clusters tab. And this is where I can go in and pick a vSphere cluster and enable Kubernetes. And when I pick that cluster and I, and I, I add a cluster and I go through this workflow, it's going to ask me a series of questions um, about the environment, the size. And it's going to use those inputs to go out and to create those VMs that we, uh, we see in there. So you'll see I have my, my three supervised control plane VMs here. Now, you'll notice up above them I in these namespaces, um, you'll notice if I expand out, like let me just take this namespace 01, expand it out. Inside of that, I have a couple of new objects. Uh, this Redis, uh, Redis cart is actually a container running on vSphere. This is what we call a vSphere pod VM. You see, it's got a different icon, but that's actually a container that's running on top of ESXi natively. And then this TKZ01 is a Tanzu Kubernetes cluster. That's a Kubernetes cluster that's running inside of this namespace. And you'll see it's got a, a number of control plane and worker nodes. So from a vSphere admin perspective, um, I go in and I set this up. Uh, but these TKCs and the workloads inside these TKCs are actually deployed and managed by the developers. I'm just providing the infrastructure, and then that infrastructure is getting handed off. Now, in terms of a little bit more about the namespace, if I come up here to the menu and I go back to workload management, you'll see uh, these namespaces. This is where we define who can access and how much of the resources in that cluster they can access. So here you'll see I have my namespace. I got permissions. All right now my dev team has full access. I can limit how much storage they have, how much CPU, memory, and uh, the storage they can use. And this is where you, you manage it all. So that's just a quick overview. If I come back in here and I go to compute, You'll see I can see my vSphere pods. I can see my deployment. So I have visibility in those Kubernetes objects. Here I see my TKC clusters, all from in the vSphere web client. So it looks and feels just like vSphere to the vSphere admin. And from a developer standpoint, you know, if I come back here and I just kind of go through my history here, um, I'll log in as a developer using this uh, command line interface. And you'll see here, it's asking me, hey, you know, you've got uh, TKC, you got namespaces, which one do you want to work with?
if I do NS01, for example, I can do a kubectl. And you don't have to worry about these kubectl commands uh, as much as, you know, this is just showing you from a developer spec perspective uh, that it does look and feel just like Kubernetes. It is Kubernetes. It's, um, you know, to the developer, they, they're they going to create YAML files, and they're going to apply those YAML files. And and that's that's pretty much it in a real short demo here, just kind of to give you an idea of what uh, vSphere with Kubernetes actually looks like in terms of that uh, admin experience from the vSphere admin perspective. Oh, Kyle, there actually someone's asking, uh, is a quick look at the networking possible? Uh, yeah, so um, this is there's several networking options available to you. Um, with Cloud Foundation, we use VMware NSX. And so you'll see here, I do have um, in this resource pool a couple of NSX Edge clusters. And so I do have an NSX instance running. So if I come out here and I go to my workload domain 01, connect out to the NSX manager. Um, and I'll just log in here. Oops. But uh, inside the NSX, what we do is we pre we uh, we add our host to the NSX fabric. We go in, we create what's called an edge cluster, and inside that edge cluster, we define our software-defined networking. So here I have these gateways: a tier zero gateway and a tier one gateway. And I pair my tier zero up with my upstream routers for BGP. That does my route propagation. And then inside that, I create these segments or these logical networks where Kubernetes is going to run. So, um, you know, networking is a whole separate topic. I don't want to get too far off track, but uh, yes, uh, the networking is very key to, uh, you know, to the vSphere with Kubernetes. In this example, with Cloud Foundation, I'm using VMware NSX. In addition to using VMware NSX, you have options with vSphere with Tanzu to use the virtual distributed switch and create port groups together with HA proxy or with the NSX advanced load balancer. So there's a lot of different options out there for you. Um, but uh, that's that's kind of the quick overview of the networking there. Hopefully that will help shed some light on on that. This is awesome, uh, Kyle. I'm so glad you showed us a demo of vSphere with Tanzu and all of the stuff that you know the full stack infrastructure brings to the table with VMware Cloud Foundation with Tanzu, right? You basically just demonstrated how VMware has you know modernized their platforms. So IT admins can basically manage Kubernetes just like they used to manage VMs. And that's what we really mean by enterprise grade, right? Because all of the capabilities that you could do with a virtual machine, we're extending all of those enterprise based capabilities around security, around lifecycle management, provisioning networking and storage infrastructure, and the resources underneath two Kubernetes workloads, right? Through our uh, uh, vCenter here that uh, Kyle just demoed for us. Yeah. I I like to, you know, I think back about four years ago, the first time I had anybody come to me and say, hey, I want to run uh, some Kubernetes on vSphere. Uh, the first question I asked them is, okay, how many VMs do you need? And they're like, no, no, I don't want VMs. I want Kubernetes. And all I knew at the time was I had to deploy VMs and they can go inside VMs. There's this kube ADM admit and there's all this stuff. They can set up Kubernetes, but it's a whole, all I was worried about was giving them VMs. Now as the vSphere admin, if they come to me and say, hey, I need a place to do some work, I can give them Kubernetes. I don't, VMs aren't in discussion. It's okay, here's your control plane, log in and go do your thing. And I can limit how much CPU memory and storage you have access and which clusters you have access to the namespace construct but I'm not getting in your way, but I'm giving you what you need and I'm very timely and responsive. You got the same experience with me on my VCF, my VMware Cloud Foundation Private Cloud, as you're gonna get from AWS or Google or anybody else that's providing Kubernetes to you from, from that standpoint. Yeah, there's another good question here from uh, Abhishek from Dubai, uh, talking about multi-tenancy in this type of environment. I mean, would we suggest starting off with something like namespaces here, Kyle? Uh, you could start off with namespaces. Uh, that's a good way to uh, set it up. Um, one thing to keep in mind is we're, you know, each vSphere cluster is in a sense going to be separate. So you could do multi-tenancy by putting different tenants on different clusters and managing them separate. Uh, if you are, uh, if you if you're not if you uh, a kind of a lesser type of multi-tenancy would be to have multiple namespaces on a single cluster. So there would be some architectural considerations to go into that design and architecture um, from a multi-tenancy standpoint. If you're like a service provider and you have different paying customers, you need to keep them completely separate. Maybe you'd have separate vCenter server instances managing separate vSphere clusters 
for each customer. So um, yeah, there's there's a lot of options there um, in terms yeah, you of- can, You can uh, dice it up a lot of different ways. Yeah. And even with the integrations with NSXT, you can do a lot more um, hard layer of kind of firewall rules that are based inside there too and stuff like right. that. Right, and I was actually working on a demo for VMworld where I'm actually showing how you can deploy uh, some containers and then uh, de apply uh, policies, security policies that will set up distributed firewall rules so that some containers can't see other containers type thing. Um, and again, that's all built in using NSX and distributed firewall capabilities. Dropping hints, make sure people come and show up to your session. <laughs> well, I haven't got it done yet, so. <laughs> Oh, I got gotcha. you. Well, Rajiv, if you want me to, I can pick it up from there and, and show my part of the demo if that helps. That would be great because, you know, obviously Kyle talked about the IT admin and their point of view and uh, the experience that vCenter, you know, can provide in this modern world. Why don't you talk yeah. about, you know, what the platform operators can do? Yeah, for sure. And, and just to kind of give uh, a little bit more color on what, what Kyle was doing right there, too. I mean, I, I've got my own vCenter Tanzu environment set up here as well. Um, I've just created a brand new cluster before this all got started. Um, so just to kind of like see what it looks like. It's pretty simple on, on what it looks like just to spin something up. You know, if you just say, this is the Kubernetes version I want, this is what I want my cluster to look like. And these are the types of virtual machines that I'd like to have it as well. So you have everything from extra small to, I don't know, like super XL, like these, they get crazy big. So like 64 vCPUs and 128 gigs of RAM. Um, but you know, there's also more things that have started to be added into the product as well. So you'll eventually be able to start creating your own types of VM classes as well uh, in a in a different in a new future version that'll be coming to to VMC. Uh, but now that we have this first sort of uh, we've got this cluster up and running, so I've got this right here, and we can see it's up and running. This was great from a, a perspective of one. Kubernetes cluster, but let's say that you know Kyle and I and Rajiv and Ning, you know, we're, we're we're the IT staff for uh you know we've got 500 different teams that we have to take care of, and each one needs their own Kubernetes cluster. So 500 Kubernetes cluster becomes a, a little bit more uh, complex to be able to take care of, not only just from a visibility standpoint of just resource consumption and figuring out how do we keep role-based access control, but how do we make sure that there are certain policies that are that are set and that are uniform across all these as well. And lo and behold, that's where Tanzu Mission Control comes in. So Tanzu Mission Control is what we call global or fleet-wide management. And we can kind of see just from this area right here, this is the ability to kind of see all of the Kubernetes clusters that have either been attached or have been provisioned and available from Tanzu Mission Control. So you have the ability to attach any cluster, whether it's running in VMC on AWS, whether it's running on a regular vSphere environment, EKS, AKS, Azure, Red Hat OpenShift, uh, Rancher, doesn't really matter. You can bring it and you can monitor it and you can kind of get some diagnostic data for all of these types of Kubernetes clusters because you want to have just this very wide overview of everything that's happening. So yeah, Kenny, I want to kind of quickly chime in here uh, sure, that sure. we... We actually see a lot of um, kind of enterprises customers have the need of this kind of multi-cluster, multi-environment environment management. Uh, we all know that Kubernetes adoption started by your developer teams. So uh, for a lot of enterprises, like even before their IT knows like what is Kubernetes, their developers are already running it in the public cloud. So uh, when the IT tried to kind of like standardize the Kubernetes infrastructure, try to bring everything underneath control, uh, they have to kind of manage a, a lot of different distributions, different um, flavors of Kubernetes across different providers. So that's the, the beauty of transmission control comes in and it can help you kind of achieve that consistency and the security and the governance around kind of your entire footprint of Kubernetes. Yeah, so just want to bring that point in. Uh, just see why we we even having like I even have like thought about having such a tool. For sure, and, and mm -hmm. one of the great things is about being able to see all these yeah. is if you can attach a cluster, you get this this sort yeah. of global overview. If you bring in a management cluster, as Kyle had showed before, you have this idea of a supervisor cluster and VSphere with with Tanzu and other instantiations of Tanzu Kubernetes Grid. You have what's called a management cluster. It's just another Kubernetes cluster, but it has cluster API 
uh, constructs on it. And that is the one that's responsible for managing all of its workload clusters or where you're going to be putting all of your applications that are running inside of Kubernetes. And you do this just through the administration interface, go to management clusters. And here is my vSphere with Tanzu environment that I have in here. And so within here, I can see that I have two different namespaces that have been created with inside of vSphere with Tanzu. And I can also see my workload clusters. Here's the cluster 01 that I had created. Uh, from the command line, we can see that it's not managed with inside of Tons of Mesh Control. So let's go ahead and click that, and we're going to add it to a cluster group. I'll explain what that means here in a second. So when I manage it, it's going to start installing a bunch of TMC extensions and, again, sending that diagnostic data back up. So that'll take a few minutes to, to kind of get that kicked off. But before that sort of happens, before we go there, I'm going to talk to you the idea of what cluster groups are. Well, we have all these clusters, but we want a way to be able to kind of categorize them. How do we put them into just simple folders, if you will? And a cluster group is really based upon whatever you want to call it. In this instance, you can see we've got dev, prod, and staging. If you want to have it based on business unit, a certain application, um, just anything you could, different types of environments, anything that you could possibly think of, that's what you can create a cluster group off of. And again, that cluster group is nothing more than a collection or a folder of different Kubernetes clusters, and they can be running on different providers anywhere. Now, this really becomes powerful by being able to say, well, now that I've got you know, 30, 50, 200, 10, whatever it is, different clusters, how do I make them uniform? How do I make sure that um, I don't have to go and manage each one individually for a certain access control or something like that. And this is where the policy engine comes in. So there's a lot of different policies available to us. So we've got access, image registry, network, security, quote, and custom. So if I want to say with inside of my development folder, I want to have a certain access policy, meaning that I can set a, uh, a role binding for a particular user to have access to it. I can do it from there. This, the image registry, part of all the Tanzu additions, they come with Project Harbor, which is a cloud native computing foundation project that is riddled with enterprise features, uh, such as uh, replication, uh, quotas, um, gosh, tag retention policies, uh, image, image vulnerability uh, frameworks and scanning. So there's a lot of ways that I can say, okay, I only want to have these particular clusters only pull from this particular image registry, or I can block certain registries. Like I'd want to make sure that nobody can pull the latest image from Docker Hub from any image. So anything that's tagged with the word latest, it will never be able to be pulled. So you can set a, a very wide amount of, of policies. And once I set it at the folder level, that's going to apply to everything underneath of it. I can also go into a, into a, a cluster directly and I can create policies that are only applied to that particular cluster too. And again, that kind of goes through all five of these different or all six of these different um, policies that are available to you. This is all built on top of OPA or Open Policy Agent, which is another highly regarded cloud native computing foundation project. So anything that so, you can build um, there can kind of relate as in there. Ning, what's yeah, you got? Kenny, actually uh, there is a question asking about um, disaster recovery for Kubernetes. I'll I know TMC, I yeah, that. TMC has an awesome feature, um, um, which can help on that. Um, yeah, make sure you, you show that. You got it. I'll, I'll, I'll feed you, Ning. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so, so one of the things that, as well as kind of, uh, Ning kind of jumped a little bit right there. You know, we, we kind of have this idea of, of wide amount of clusters, but as, as Bishesh want to know a little bit more is, well, what do you do about disaster recovery? What do you do about backup? You know, it's, it's funny when you think about this world of Kubernetes, this was never something that was intended to be uh, as a part of this. Nobody thought about disaster recovery or, or backup because the idea yeah. of a lot of things that started in Kubernetes was that it's non-persistent. You're running web servers, you're running application mm -hmm. servers, you're not running anything that really requires data per se. And so anything it's not that mission you do, critical. Yeah, yeah. It, well, and that's that, that narrative has changed over the past few years now. And so, Pretty much 90% of what we're running now is we have applications that have some sort of persistent data or persistent data access. Exactly. Uh, and and yeah. really that persistent data access is, is really all that comes into it. It's not the same exact idea of I have a virtual machine and it has a hard disk and I have to back it up and I have to make sure that this is available somewhere else. Instead, 
everything is abstracted. So you have what's called a persistent volume claim, and that persistent volume claim maps to a persistent volume, and a container requests a persistent volume claim. Once it's attached, then it can go ahead and start interacting and reading and writing that data. As soon as that container leaves, this persistent volume claim releases, and then another container can come in, access that persistent volume claim, and then write to it. So your idea of, of disaster recovery and backup has to change when you go through this. Um, if you can bring my screen back up, I'm still going to keep showing that. Uh, so the idea within this as well is that now that we have our clusters available to us, um, and we have cluster 01 that I had started to manage right here first, so I can go into it. I can see that all the TMC extensions have been installed. Um, I'm starting to get some information about uh, use resource utilization. I can get information about the nodes. I can go in and see what kind of pods are running on them. But to kind of hit the what Ning had talked about earlier, we all have this, this button down here that says enable data protection. So I can enable that. And what that's going to do is that's going to install some more TMC extensions that's going to allow the use of another open source project called Valero. And Valero, once this gets installed, will allow me to take backups of this cluster, either I can do the whole cluster, I can do a certain namespace, I can do it based on label selectors, and I can set whatever sort of cron schedule I wanted to it as well. And these get backed up into an S3 compatible data store. So you can just say, I can open up an S3 bucket and have them go there, or I can install MinIO and I can run that in an environment and I can have my backups go there. And then from there, you sort of set your own policy on how you take care and make sure that these backups are either replicated offsite um, from that particular bucket. And the restoration process using Valero is, is quite simple. All you're doing is just taking uh, in the configuration and the data, the, it takes the persistent data and it will go ahead and uh, import it into another cluster. So super easy to be able to do from, from that side. So that's the data protection side. Um, last thing I'll kind of show you as well is you can also run inspections. So you want to see conformance testing and actually see if your cluster is going by the what we call the official guidelines of what does a Kubernetes conformant cluster look like. Um, this is all upstream based. Uh, you also want to run security, you know, CIS benchmarks to say, is this um, adhering to some of the best security practices that is seen by the upstream community? Now, we do not apply these security practices or the security um, things that it, it does check. But instead, we give you the ability to choose how hardened or how not hardened you want this cluster to be. And you're going to get a, a result at the end that says, well, what does this look like? So I can go to my insights over here, or sorry, I can go to my inspections tab over here. Um, I can wait for that to come, but I'll just show you one that's already been ran over here. And it tells me exactly what failed and some warnings and what passed for running all of these different kind of security tests that are coming from the upstream compat or the upstream community. And so now you can go and you can take this and start hardening your cluster as you see fit or as whatever your sec security policies dictate. And we can Fabulous. This stuff. is this is amazing stuff. I mean, th this is what we mean by enterprise grade Kubernetes, right? I mean, this is exactly what VMware brings on the table. The flexibility to deal with multi-cloud Kubernetes deployments, you know, through VMware. Tanzu Kubernetes Grid or any of the other uh, native Kubernetes providers, right, from any of the public clouds uh, on one control plane called the Tanzu Mission Control, right? Kyle, there was also one other question that I was hoping we could address for Shri Kant here, uh, who is asking, how do I get started uh, with Kubernetes? So let's say customers are on a previous vSphere version, right? What are the requirements that they need to sort of meet to to sort of get started. Well, to get started, probably the the most significant thing is is vSphere seven. If you have vSphere seven, um, you have everything you need to get started. Um, it, the Kubernetes capabilities built into vSphere with Tanzu are built directly into um, vSphere seven. So there's some licensing and pricing um, requirements, uh, you know, that you have to take care of. Of course, uh, you do have that sixty day trial 
period you get with every vSphere install that you can use. So if you want to do it in a, another environment. Another way you can get started is uh, through the VMware user group community, vMug community. That's a way if you go in and get their vMug advantage, you can get access to uh, license keys and stuff through the VM, vMug advantage program. Um, so those are those are ways you can get access to the binaries and you can get started. And really, the, the only requirement we have is you have a vSphere uh, 7 cluster. And you have the the you know either the trial license or the license keys, and you can just go in and start enabling Kubernetes and uh, standing it up. Um, you know if you if you you know HA proxy I believe is a you know free you can download it and use it. If you want just a, something simple to help you get the networking up and running, you can use that. Um, if you want to look at something, you know if you're an enterprise company and you have NSX, you can look at uh, bringing in the the cloud foundation and the vSphere with Tanzu or the VCF with Tanzu. So, so really, that's that's about it as far as getting started. Um, <clears throat> there's some great hands-on labs out there. So, um, if you if you just you know you're you're just wanting to get your first experience with logging in, go to the VMware hands-on lab. I think it's 2113 is the hands-on lab that will basically walk you through the whole experience of enabling vSphere with Tanzu and and getting started. And then from there, you can then start looking at your own labs and how to implement it in your own labs. Um, there's a yeah, question. There are, yeah, more question popping up. Um, like, what is the difference between Tanzu and Tanzu Grid? So, yeah, so um, I mean, product marketing. So, I really want to kind of get, um, give a comment on this. So, Tanzu, VMware Tanzu is VMware's modern apps brand, which includes a portfolio of products and services. And uh, you, you probably heard uh, Tanzu Kubernetes Grid, Tanzu Mission Control. Tanzu build services. Uh, we actually have uh, quite a long list of Tanzu products, and uh, Tanzu Kubernetes Grid is one of the Tanzu products. And Tanzu itself is just a portfolio name. It is not one thing. Um, yeah, I think that probably addresses your question. Okay. Um, and another question: Any integration with uh, VRA? That's a good question. So. Um, so VRA uh, is VMware's kind of flagship um, um, operations of um, cloud uh, operations, multi-cloud operations uh, uh, product. And uh, the current plan is uh, transmission control is a dedicated Kubernetes management, multi-cluster Kubernetes management and operation uh, product. And the VRA actually covers both VM and containers. And there are kind of work um, happening right now to really integrate VRA and transmission control to have VRA drive transmission control API and uh, for some container Kubernetes related functionalities. So the work is happening um, and we definitely see the synergy between these two products. And I think the goal in the end is you really want to, uh, for a lot of enterprises, they want to manage both the VM and the containers uh, at the same time. Um, so yeah, um, it is uh, integration work uh, planned um, and going on. I'll just add to what Ning said, right? I mean, we realize obviously brings a lot of infrastructure automation capabilities yeah. to customers who want to even potentially take, you know, this infrastructure as a code, as a, as a mindset and like deploy that as a practice to automate their infrastructure operations all across. Uh, and, and obviously like what the demos that uh, Kenny shared talk about sort of the Kubernetes operations and how they are enterprise grade ready and, and multi-cloud ready. So Kenny, you wanted to uh, talk a little bit more about Shrikant's question? Yeah, Shrikant said, uh, said, show me the Kubernetes install. I said, okay, well, let's do that. So uh, there is, as I mentioned earlier, here is the manifest on all it takes to create a Kubernetes cluster. Now with vSphere Tanzu, you get a, a kubectl vSphere plugin and that enables you to just say, uh, more just more kubectl commands, if you will. So now what we can do is we have already authenticated to our namespace. Um, and once we're authenticated our namespace, see if I can scroll up a little bit uh, where I change the context right here. So I'm in our, my context, our context of Tanzu 01. And that means that it is with inside of right here, namespace inside of Tanzu 01. So inside of this namespace, we can see that we've got a few different things going on, but let me go ahead and just show you the uh, host and clusters view again. And so here is this cluster 01 that's been created right here. And what I wanna do is I had just edited. So instead of having two workers, I'm gonna have three. 
So I just apply it the same way I apply any sort of thing in Kubernetes, of whether it's a deployment or a pod or a service or anything like that. And what it's going to do is this is all working in desired state configuration, saying that I want to move from two workers to three. I go and check over here, and we can see that the third worker is just now spinning up. It's going to start creating or deploying the OVF template. It's going to start um, doing everything it needs for kubeadm to join itself to the cluster. And after that, you're going to see it as an additional resource uh, when you say like kubectl get nodes or, or anything like that. So that's how you scale a cluster. But the same process just goes to create a cluster. Um, desired state to say this is what I want it to look like. And, and this is what it's going to look like after it gets done doing its lifecycle management pieces of it. And wow, that was fast. You know, yeah, they're also questioning about multi-tenancy. Um, can Tanzu support multi-tenant configurations? Yeah, it can. we can do that in a few different ways. We kind of covered that a little bit at first. So mm -hmm. you could do it uh, starting here at the at the vSphere Tanzu level, um, saying that I want to base it off of namespaces. Remember when I went through here before, I can set different permissions. Um, these are all baked into vSphere SSO. So I can set that, you know, there's a particular group or a user that has uh, edit access and that's it. Nobody else has access to that. And it's all you know, kind of going through your OIDC or your LDAP setup and, and everything like that. Um, so there's that you could do it based upon, you know, just within inside of Kubernetes. Um, so if you have, if you put different particular role bindings, as we kind of talked about here with the policies and having access policies, um, and secure, or should I say, you have access policies of who has access to it. And again, this this all ties back into what TNC has access to for its its setup and, and hooking back into your um, your uh, identity provider. And that can then just flow through the individual Kubernetes side of things. Now, once it's inside of Kubernetes, you can then do namespace uh, separation with inside of there too. So uh, there's there's multiple ways that you can go and, and get multi-tenant uh, capabilities through here. Creep, the question's coming, folks. And thank you, Kenny, for answering that one. There's another one on security, right? And yeah. all, all along, I want to say like one thing. How do I, uh, Salam is asking, how to protect my Kubernetes from attacks like viruses and, and malware, right? So one thing I want to say is, you know, when VMware like brings these tools to market, like the way we've architected TKG clusters on our on-prem environments, right? vSphere and VCF with Tenzu, these clusters are fully isolated from each other, right? And there's network isolation and they're also fully conformant, uh, right? Uh, Kubernetes environments. So that automatically like protects these clusters from a lot of these attacks and, and malware. Uh, Anything you guys want to add to this? Uh, so I just, I would just say like with the Cloud Foundation and the VMware Software Defined Data Center, you know, security is built into vSphere. NSX has security built in. And so when you deploy, you know, there's four networks you're going to have to set up. Two of them are non-routable. And when you deploy with NSX, we're going to set up NAT and we're going to be able to expose services out through, uh, you know, the, the NSX interface using, uh, you know, the... Uh, the network policies inside of Kubernetes. And because we're using NSX, we can use the distributed firewall. So, so security is built in throughout the SDDC, mm -hmm. throughout VMware Cloud Foundation. And uh, you know it's kind of intrinsic in the sense that it's kind of built in and you're only exposing the services that you want. And then you can go ahead and, and secure those ports and those uh, services uh, using those built in firewall and capabilities. Yeah, uh, and just to kind of go on there. So we take a, a, the same exact approach as the Kubernetes upstream community. So in minus two and sometimes in minus three, we, we've been supporting some, some backdated versions of Kubernetes. So VMware produces images and builds uh, for you that are based on, uh, for right now, what you'll be seeing is based on Photon and the future we'll see Ubuntu based uh, images. And that goes through you know, a typical, our typical um, security enhancement and security policy that we have for kind of like tightening down the OS. And we put in all the components necessary to build a Kubernetes um, cluster. And so we make sure we do all that integration testing too. Uh, another thing to kind of mention is I talked about Harbor earlier too. So mm -hmm. just to give you an idea, here's an, here's literally the latest Nginx image that I've taken from Docker Hub, pushed it into Harbor, 
And you can see that through the Trivi vulnerability scanner, it found 192 different vulnerabilities. It's up to you to decide how vulnerable they are, um, but you can go ahead, you can click on this, you can kind of get information about really what this vulnerability is inside of this image. So this allows you to take this image, either patch it or do whatever it is, and then re-upload it, let it go ahead and scan, or you can set different whitelists for different critical vulnerabilities. So it won't actually scan for these when you want to, uh, when you kind of want to just like, again, whitelist it. So there's a lot of different ways that you can kind of take a, a security standpoint with this. Yeah, I think even the policy engine, I think the the like we built it to really help you kind of enforce your um, any compliance or security rules, uh, like networking, we have a container registry policy, networking policy, you can like configure it to make sure it meets your organization's kind of security compliance standards. Um, and I think also relates to another buzzword we hear quite often today is called DevSecOps. So security is also kind of intrinsic into the whole process, DevOps process, right? You have to have your Dev security and ops team all working together in the whole process. It should be integrated and intrinsic. Yeah. Um, there's another question um, asking about, um, can we actually integrate other third-party Kubernetes firewalls um, into the solution? I'm not sure if Kenny or Kyle um, so the firewall would be kind of a little bit outside of this. So anything that we do today is based, uh, and for the networking component of it, is is really for load balancer services. Um, and that's what Kubernetes cares about. Like Kubernetes says, I need to talk to my, my cloud provider interface, and that cloud provider interface is going to then talk to um, the whatever network is connected to it. And so we either have should I say native connections into NSXT or NSX advanced load balancer. And you've, you'll see some other things like HA proxy, but those are kind of what we call new legacy. Uh, we, don't, we wouldn't encourage you to use that right now. Uh, so we have a, a lot of different integrations in with more of our commercial products. And that is so you can request uh, a service type of load balancer and you can do north southbound traffic. Um, anything outside of the, if you were to integrate a different firewall, it would have to be done after the uh, the provisioning is complete and you will have to kind of um, handhold it is the best way to put it because it would probably be fragile knowing that if you are going to be doing, say, upgrading from one Kubernetes version to the next, don't set it based on virtual machines or virtual machine names because anytime you upgrade to another version of Kubernetes, it's done in a rolling upgrade fashion. We don't upgrade Kubernetes inside the virtual machine, but instead we create new virtual machines with the new Kubernetes version. They're added to the cluster. The original virtual machines that are there get demoted, removed from the cluster, and then the virtual machines are are deleted. So that's how the lifecycle management process works with uh, with cluster API. The game has changed. We are modernizing it on, on all fronts and, and really making this uh, enterprise grade kubernetes deployments available so customers can you know deploy this at scale in production on premise or in the cloud uh, through vmware tanzu and through vmware cloud right so uh, i'd say if we were to vote on whether abhishek or salam you know gave the most amount of questions it would be a very close tie <laughs> we, <laughs> we we have one more question uh from salam can you yes. have multiple yeah. content libraries so yeah, so I'll take that. I... So yeah, so the content library is something that's been built into vSphere going back to vSphere 5, and it's just a way to have a shared uh, repository where you can store OVA images and templates and things like that. With vSphere with Tanzu, we use the content library to download and to store those OVA images that we use when we deploy those those guest clusters. and. Uh, so uh, you'll set that up, and there's you can either manually upload the images or you can subscribe and have those images automatically pulled down. As Kenny mentioned, right now it's all Photon-based, but going forward we expect to see some Ubuntu-based images become available. But that's all done from the content library. And when you create a namespace, you associate a namespace with a content library. And uh, when I seen the question, I went out to my lab real quick and was clicking around just to verify this. But yes, you can go into each namespace and you can edit the content library, and you could have like three or four different content libraries libraries and different uh, namespaces for each. So if you want to restrict certain uh, 
developers to only use certain images, you could set up a content library just for them and associate that to that namespace. And then a separate namespace could have a different content library. So yes, you can do that. Awesome. Okay, I think we are on time. Yeah, so Ling, yeah, you wanna... Thought, you went so fast. I thought one hour gonna be really like, <laughs> hard to kill, but yeah. I know, thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone on the panel and all the attendees that joined us live with all the questions. Really, uh, I think we're gonna do a lot more of these. So look forward to them. And I think the final sort of call to action from all of us at VMware is join us at VMworld. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and register now. You're gonna learn about all the great innovations we're bringing to market besides you know, making uh, Kubernetes deployments enterprise yeah. grade. And the content catalog is actually live already. So you can actually go in and find a lot of um, Kubernetes related sessions and the vSphere with tons of sessions. Yeah, feel free to take a look and register. Thank right. you, folks. All right, thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Have a good day. Bye.